Uh, uh, Toby is well known to many of us for his work in the field. He's one of the few people here who is named after an antisensor like we've had. And, and um, I don't know how that happened. And um, we're, we're excited to have you here, Toby, and to hear, hear how you uh, can sort of uh, update us on per person and what we've learned about uh, SOB1 and, and uh, C9 through the ASO trials. Great. Let's see. Can people see my screen? Um, we, we see. Not yet. Not seeing your presentation. Yet, okay. We are seeing your screen. There we go. How about now? Yeah, perfect. Great. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, some, some learnings from SOD1 and a, and a bit of a comment on our C9 programs. Um, first, just thanks thanks to the ALS1 team for the chance to, to review some of the learnings and, and present at this forum. It's, it's much appreciated. Um, some, some disclosures. Um, the just briefly, as I mean, James has nicely already highlighted to persons, it's an investigative investigational antisense oligonucleotide. It's really designed to knock down SOD1 uh, through degradation of SOD1 mRNA. And that's really predicated on, on a lot of the work done by some of the people on this call. Um, and it's, it's one of the, the targets in ALS that we know, we know the most about. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons sort of why Biogen, when we realized ASOs could be, be a potential therapeutic tool that we started there. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on the extension data um, because that's, that's, I think, the data that's been most instructive um, as, as we've seen the both Valor and the extension data evolve. Just to remind the group, um, Tafersen was initially studied in a 28-week trial, um, 100 milligrams versus placebo, and, and that, that outcome was uh, looking at the ALS functional rating scale as the, as, the, as the primary measure of efficacy. Um, and really, one key point of that trial is that we pre-specified um, looking for a faster progressing population, given that the trial was six months, to based on either mutation, which there's a fair amount of naturally suggesting that some mutations move more quickly, or your preclinical uh, rate of decline on, on your ALS home store rating scale. We also pre-specified um, uh, uh, looking at um, effect based on uh, being above or below median neurofilament. I mean, you've heard from James a lot about sort of neurofilament as an emerging tool. I think that the first data is really uh, reaffirming that position as an important tool across ALS drug development for the SOD program at least, and a, a number of key lessons. And I'll try to highlight those as I go through. So the, the, the open label extension data, I think a couple of key points are, well, I'm sorry, before I get to that, I, I should highlight that the valor didn't meet its primary endpoint in six months. Um, we, we just want to be transparent about that. So really what we're going to discuss here is what happens after that initial six month period. So this is a, a data cut from January. It's when all the participants had a chance for at least 12 months of follow-up and that's important. Um, also, I think it's also important to highlight that we uh, used baseline neurofilament as a covariate. So your neurofilament when you started Valor and we use that as, as a covariate to adjust for disease progression rates. I'll highlight that this in this context, we then looked at all the patients in the trial. So everyone, fast or slow, you were, you were analyzed in this, this analysis that I'm about to share. So I think, I mean, it's always important to ask the simple question first, and that is, does the ASO as a potential therapeutic do its job, i.e. does it alter the biology you expect it to alter? Um, and so what you see here is measurement of SOD protein in the CSF to orient you to the the design of the slide, which is consistent for all the endpoints that I'll share, is the, the blue bar is the 28 week point. So Valor is on the left and the extension is on the right. The dashed line is, is participants who initially received the SIBO, then converted to Tofersen. Uh, the green line are folks who were always on Tofersen. And I think here, what you see both immediately about from week eight, starting probably at week eight, but certainly maximum by 12, you see reductions of SOD1 in the CSF and persistence of that reduction. And then you see when participants tra transfer to the to person in, in the OLE, again, reduction of SOD1. I think it's important to highlight that these measuring total SOD1 in the CSF, based on modeling, we predict that you get substantially greater, greater reductions in tissue, particularly spinal cord and brainstem, which is think we, the areas we think are of key need for intervention in this, in this form of ALS. 
Our estimates are greater than 90% reduction in tissues, but that does await confirmation um, formally. So we've talked a lot about neurofilament. I think here it, we had our phase one experience suggested we could reduce neurofilament and you see that confirmed here. Um, about 50% reduction in the early start patients. And then when the placebo patients transitioned over again, a very robust reduction following initiation of coperson. And again, and this is plasma neurofilament light. But a very, simple, a very clear result in this regard. So what happens at, at cl on, to clinical function? So this is the ALS function rating scale and outcome measure we all know well. Um, and what we see is some separation at 28 weeks, which was consistent with the observations in Valor. Um, but over time, you see a greater separation. And so the interpretation here is that the early start patients, i.e. those in green, appear to do better than the later start patients, with a difference of about three and a half points uh, at week 52. On respiratory function, you see a similar a pattern. And that is um, emergent separation at week 28, but then at week 52, about 9.2 points of difference um, favoring the early start participants. Muscle strength is an interesting endpoint in ALS. It's, it, it gets to the core feature of the biology of the disease. Um, I actually view it as something intermediate between uh, target engagement, neurofilament, and then clinical effect. I think it's a bit of a difficult question what a meaningful change in strength is uh, in this disease, but nonetheless, because of the biology it represents, I think it's important to measure. And here what you see is decline um, through week 28, and then at, at worst you see stabilization of strength in the early start group, um, starting about week 28, and in the week 40 group you see a similar pattern, sorry, I'm sorry, in the Delayed start group at week 40, you see a similar pattern. You also could potentially see, see increases here, but that, that will remain to be, needs to be formally verified. Um, but certainly if, if we could conceive of a drug that modified strength, we think it could be important in ALS. These are the, the, the data on survival. Again, these are early, and so there have not been enough events to formally estimate um, time to death. And so this, this, this part of the extension remains ongoing, so we'll continue to follow uh, these subjects. Um, if you look at um, death or permanent ve ventilation or just death, the odds ratios are 0.27 to 0.36, so a potential compelling reduction in the risk of death. As a sensitivity analysis, we also looked at um, additional um, uh, variables, including withdraw from the study um, or withdraw due to disease progression. Um, and so it, you see those are basically consistent with the initial analysis and that's why we checked those. So it, when, when FDA is considering a therapy, um, they, they wanna know how it affects the, the patient's ability to think, feel and function. Um, PROs are an important component of this trial. Um, and you can see three outlined here. The ALSAQ5 is an ALS specific uh, quality of life measure. Um, and, and you can see again in the early start patients, um, they, they appear to do better than the late, the delayed start patients. Um, we also looked at the EQ5D5L. This is a more general quality of life measure, again, uh, favoring the early start patients. Fatigue is, as, as many of us call, or most of us call, no, is a, is a key component of neuromuscular disease, and, and ALS is not accepted. Um, here you saw favoring of, of tofersin, but not, not as wide a separation as the other PROs. And that, that was the only one that was not nominally statistically significant. It's also important to, when you're discussing efficacy, it's important to highlight um, safety. I think we, we outlined here the key safety events. I think there are a number of the common ones related to both lumbar puncture and to the disease. Um, I think the serious ones to highlight really are myelitis, uh, of which we had two incidences. And then um, it's important to note that those were manageable with the context of standard of care and or withdrawal of the drug. And a, a similar comment can be made about the other serious adverse events. So I think 
the, the Tafersen trial, I think, is is been quite instructive in helping us think through how we think about drug development in ALS. I think the team has defined a, a sequence of events that that has, I think, on the face, biologic validity, and that is that you initially reduce SOD1, so the SO engages the target. You then see a biologic effect with reduction of plasma neurofilament, which we think implies reduction of axon injury and neurodegeneration. Um, we saw some suggestions of clinical effect at that 28-week time point that were all favoring tofersen, but, but not statistically significant. But then as you move into longer periods of time, you then see this emergence of reduced decline on function, breathing, strength, quality of life, and potentially survival, all favoring early start tofersen. So, so the, the overall status for the molecule is, as this group likely knows, I'll highlight that the, the data has been recently published in the New England Journal, so it's available for all to see. The, and we continue to engage with regulators, but particularly we are engaging with the FDA, um, and we have a PRODUFA date for the molecule on January 25th. Um, and, and one of the point, key points of that discussion will be the utility of neurofilament as a surrogate endpoint for the molecule. I want to make a few comments on c 9 or 72 It's the other uh, main genetic cause of ALS. We had a program, um, FIB78, which was an ASO designed to um, be a potential therapeutic for treatment of c 9 ALS. This, this molecule was designed to test a specific scientific hypothesis and therapeutic hypothesis. You can see here outlined sort of the classic way that c 9 Expansion repeat pathogenesis is thought of, and that really is a, has a loss of potentially a loss of function component, a gain of function component with two key components, and that is toxic gain of function driven by a sense strand and or an anti sense strand. And the BIB78 molecule really des was designed to ameliorate pathogenesis from the sense strand only, so it tested a subset of the available therapeutic hypotheses. In that context, we saw clear reduction of GA and GP. These are two toxic species made from the expansion repeat. And this is therefore an indirect measure of target engagement. Um, and so the ASO in this case seems to be doing its job. Um, unlike the SOD program, we saw a moderate increase in neurofilament in this case at both 60 and 90 milligram doses. And we saw no difference on clinical scores um, but perhaps with trending to be slightly worse at 90 milligrams. So consistent directional in, in a directional manner with the neurofilament signal. That's probably an important concept. Um, and th I, th I think overall, we could ask, there could be potentially many reasons for this observation that the FIB78 ASO did not um, appear to modify the disease in inappropriately. Um, maybe we just need to address the other mechanisms such as haploid insufficiency or the antisense transcripts. Maybe you also need to address TDP43 pathology. Um, and maybe there's other un as yet unknown mechanisms. I think what I'd highlight here is that genetic targets increase our chances of success, but sort of understanding the pathogenic mechanisms are critical. Um, and and I, I would argue, based on this experience, I think we need to continue to understand and work on how c north causes disease but it does not um, diminish the, the importance of this target. So I think maybe just to, to end, I'll highlight that this work takes a large team. Um, we highlight here the Tofersen and MIB78 steering committees and the investigators. But I think first and foremost, really the thanks is to the participants, to the families and their caregivers for really making this possible. And, and this we've also highlighted below the broad community support, including ALS-1, that also make this, uh, uh, make meaningful contributions and with whom out we would not be successful. So thanks broadly to the community as well. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. <clears throat> Toby, thank you very much for, for outlining that. We do have, a, um, I think, a number of questions. Um, let's go back to the top. Um, so one question is about the, the cutoff at 24 weeks. I mean, I, I, I guess I just um, 
you know, specifically the question, you know, references sort of, you know, cut off at 24 versus 28 weeks. And, and um, you know, if you any, any, have any thoughts about that, I guess one thing I would I'd just maybe broaden the question to say, um, how do you think about the trial duration? How does it, you know, how does it impact your thinking about trial duration? You may need to answer that by sort of um, depending on the drug or the target. So, so I think, I mean, at a high level, what I'd say is, is the, the biologic sequence that we define. I find just can't the part time on exam, so I finally bought them. Oh. Don't mind me. Sorry, um, somebody, is, somebody is not muted here. I have my other login time on Twitter, Sam. I don't know if I'm going to keep them or not. I mean, they're probably fine for them now. Uh, so Jamie, Jamie Martin? Jamie. I don't know. Jamie, we're, we're wondering if you could put yourself on mute. Yeah. Um, Jen, you may, okay. be, you may be able to move people. So let me try. Let me try again. So I think I think in I think in, in general, James, it will it will depend on the on the the molecule, the target. Um, the so I, I what I'll highlight is we saw. Sod reduction preceded neurofilament reduction, and then, and then at 52 weeks, we start to see emerging clinical effect. And so I think you, you need time for that. You likely need time for that target engagement and time for that downstream biologic effect, and then a clinical effect. So I think in general, I would say that you probably want to err on the side of longer trials, unless you have an explicit reason to Think that you can engage the target of ultra biology more quickly. Um, in the six-month trial, we saw about twelve at twelve weeks, where we really saw clear reductions in our filament. And, and so, I do think, in general, longer trials are probably better. But that being said, you you could think of particular circumstances where you could make them shorter. And I, I think there are also a number of measurement issues around shorter trials that we we could also highlight that are separate from the biology. I think most important is, are you, does the duration of the trial match the biology you're trying to change? And I think if the results in tofersin can be generalized, which we don't know yet, to other forms of ALS, um, then you potentially need longer trials. Or you need a mechanism by which you formalize the design that's been done here, which is six month and then extension, and that package supports an approval. I mean, you, could, you can conceive of that way as well. That's, that's great. There's another question about, which is tied to this, uh, which comes from, from Bob Brown, which is about um, looking at fast progressors versus slow progressors. And I think that, well, I don't know, may, maybe that's tied to the duration of the study. Maybe it's not tied to the duration of the study at all. So I think one key lesson from this trial has been, so just to remind the group, we used mutation type, for which we thought there was reasonable natural history, and or pre-study clinical progression based on change in the ALS functional rating scale as a method to predict a faster progressing population. This is one of the areas where, the, where the, that, that knowledge did not translate into the trial. And so I think one of the key lessons we've taken from this experience is that those tools were not sufficient to define a faster progressing population. And that's largely because I think even in the context of, of FIV, where we think we have some understanding of natural history, for example, Patients progress variably f compared to each other, but also over the course, an individual may progress at faster or slower rates throughout the course of their disease. And that's maybe particularly enhanced in small and shorter trials. I think the other key lesson is that in terms of what was a better tool, baseline neurofilament seemed to be much more precisely pr predict disease progression than these other tools. So that's an important lesson we've learned. And, and so what I would say there is, and, and I, would, I would formally rely on that tool as a covariate to adjust for the disease progression variability. And that way, also, you can look at both slow and fast in one cohort, which is what we did in this ITT analysis for the extension. But Toby, this is, first of all, it's a fantastic landmark achievement, and, and there just aren't words to say how important it is. It's great work. <clears throat> but the question is, if you look back retrospectively at different mutations, do you nonetheless, I respect everything you just said, see a difference in the response to tofersin? Um, so the, the short answer is, 
based on mutation types, it appears to be mutation agnostic in terms of response. If, if you use, for example, reduction of neurofilament as a one marker. And, and, and there, I think the, 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 the pull through on in terms of clinical development would be that you can look for responses in both quickly progressive patients and more slowly progressive patients. Um, uh, it, uh, really interesting and a lot, I think there's a lot to, to think through there on those two topics, the duration of the, of the trial, the rapidity of the disease progression, how we measure those. We could talk for a long, long time about those. Um, uh, we'll do one more question and then and then we'll get um, to, our, to our next speaker. So one more question has to do with um, safety and, and whether um, there's a difference in the kind of adverse events that you're seeing and people have been treated for a longer period of time, uh, whether you're continuing to gather data or, or have any thoughts about this versus short-term exposure. So what I'll highlight is, is the, the safety experience in Valor and the events we observed there, including the serious events and the longer-term safety observations over the 52-week portion of the trial and the extension, safety trials were, were quite consistent and there, were, there was not emergence of new and different safety events with longer treatment. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Toby. Really wonderful. I, I, I you know, I can't underline what what Bob said just now enough, which is that this truly is landmark, and um, I think really incredible for the field. Obviously, for anyone who's touched by this disease, and, and all of us who treat it, but for the entire field, just incredible. So thank you. I mean, we we couldn't do it without all of you. So we thank you. <laughs>